Good morning, Revolve Bible Church. Today we're taking a break from our study through the book of 1 Peter to bring to you a message by Dr. Richard Vargas. Dr. Vargas is the executive director of the IFCA. The IFCA is the Independent Fundamental Churches of America. It's an association of men and women who represent over a thousand churches worldwide. Independent means that they're churches that are not a part of a denomination. Fundamental means that we believe in what is called historic fundamentalism. Historic fundamentalism came out of the, what's called the fundamentalist controversy of the 1900s. And if you want to learn more about fundamentalism, there's a link below. Whether you're watching on our website or Facebook or YouTube, you can go ahead and click that link and it'll take you to the Voice magazine, which is in a publication by the IFCA. And that takes you to a particular magazine that speaks a little bit about what is historic fundamentalism. Now, although Revolve Bible Church is not an official member of the IFCA, I am a member of the IFCA. And I had the opportunity to sit down with Dr. Vargas at the beginning of March of this year, and we had a wonderful time of fellowship. And I commend his ministry to you. He is a faithful man. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about him before we tune into this morning's Bible study. Uh, Dr. Vargas graduated from uh, Biola University with a BA, and then he received his Master's of Divinity and Doctorate of Ministry from the Master Seminary. He served for over 20 years in various ministries throughout the Southern California area, and he was also uh, an associate a faculty member for the Master Seminary, where he was training men for pastoral ministry. So I'm delighted this morning to introduce you to Dr. Richard Vargas and to the IFCA. So please, if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, grab it and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And this morning, we'll be looking at verses 10 through 12 in a message by Dr. Vargas entitled, Motivations for Courageous Living. Well, it's a great honor to be with you here this morning as we open up the Word of God. I'm going to ask you if you'd take your Bible and open up to 2 Timothy chapter 1. I know it's a difficult time that we're all going through right now. And I believe that the Word of God has many things that would help us in these times. So if you take your Bible and open it up to 2 Timothy chapter 1, I want to begin in verse 8. The Word of God says this, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we ask you right now, Lord God, that you would open your word to our understanding. We pray, Father, that as your word is explained and as we comprehend what it has to say to us. We pray that your spirit would do his amazing work in us. We pray that you would help us to understand and apply your word. For those that are anxious, we pray that you would give them your peace. For those that are struggling with fear, Lord, we pray that you would remove it and replace it with a confidence that can only be found in you. And those, Lord God, that don't know you, I pray, Lord, that they would hear the words of Scripture and know that they have come from a holy God who loves them with an everlasting love, and that they would turn to you, and that you would receive them as your children as they place their faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who has died for their sins and offers them forgiveness if they would place their faith and trust in him. We ask your blessing upon your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, in these times, we need men and women of courage. And we usually think of men, oftentimes, when we think of courage. But as I was thinking about examples of courageous people in the Bible, my mind immediately went to 
three women. The first one was Esther. She was the one who faced her fears and went before the king to ask for help. She needed to stave off the attacks of those that hated the Jews, knowing that the king, when she went before him, might put her to death for coming into his court uninvited. Then there was Deborah in the book of Judges. She led the armies of Israel because during her time, the men were too cowardly to do it themselves. And that led me to remember a woman named Jael. She's in Judges chapter 4. She calmed the Canaanite commander Sisera when he sought shelter in her tent. She allowed him to fall asleep and then lulled into a sense of security and safety. She drove a tent peg through his temple. All three of these women were bold and courageous women of faith. They trusted the Lord in very extraordinary circumstances. They could have run. They could have prayed that God would provide someone else who would be given the task that they were given, but they didn't. Each one, with a looming possibility of failure and even death, faced their fears with great courage. The Apostle Paul wrote this book, 2 Timothy, to young pastor Timothy in the church of Ephesus. He wrote it regarding his need to be brave, not to be fearful as he faced impending death for preaching the gospel. And of course, Timothy struggled with this. And so Paul laid out for him some motivations for facing the tasks that he had been given by God with strength and with dependence from the Lord. In the time that we're living in right now, there is a lot of fear. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of wringing of hands inside the church as well as outside. But God's word has given us the answer. So in our time right now in the word, I want us to see four motivations that God gives us in verses 10 through 12. Four motivations so that we would live courageous lives. The first one is found in verse 10. Notice that this motivation is the fact that Christ has abolished death for you and me as Christians. Christ has abolished death for us. Again, look at what it says in verse 10. Which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death. Back in verse 9, it references that which has been planned before the ages began. And that was made a reality in time and space on earth. The purposes of God that brought about Paul's, Timothy's, and even your salvation became a reality when Christ died upon the cross. And when you received his death on your behalf at your regeneration. This is that which was manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, it says. Now, although the word appearing is always used for Christ's second coming in the New Testament, in this passage, in verse 10, there's an exception. Here, the appearing speaks not of his second coming, but of his incarnation and his life, his crucifixion, and of course, his resurrection. Christ's ministry on earth brought about two results, which Paul uses as our first two motivations for courageous living. He abolished death. And then the second part says, he brought life and immortality. So let's look at the abolishing of death first. How is it that Christ could abolish death when death is still all around us? even for those of us who are Christians. When we contrast the death spoken of here with the life and immortality that comes next in the verse, we can see that Paul is writing about spiritual life, and therefore he's talking about spiritual death. Spiritual death was what occurred in the moment that Adam and Eve disobeyed the Lord in the Garden of Eden. When they ate of that forbidden fruit, the Lord promised them, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. 
That was in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And although Adam and Eve would eventually physically die, they didn't do so on that day. But they did die spiritually on that day. Death is a separation. Physical death is a separation of the body from the soul. And spiritual death is a separation of the creature from our Creator. But Jesus' death on the cross reversed the curse of sin that brought both physical and spiritual death to us. Right here in verse 10, where it says that Jesus Christ abolished death. That word abolished means to render inoperative, for its power to be broken. Speaking of breaking the power of death, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 and 55, these words. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Jesus Christ took on flesh so that he could die. He took on flesh so that he could, as a man, represent men on the cross. He would die as a condemned man in the place of guilty mankind. And he would take the punishment we rightly deserved. And in dying, he destroyed the power that the devil had over us. That's exactly what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15. There the scripture says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. I remember reading a pastor who related the story of how when he was a little boy, he would enjoy waiting for bees to land on flowers in his yard. And when they landed, he would very carefully grab those bees by their wings and then push them onto his leather belt until they stung the belt, leaving their stingers behind. And once the stinger was gone, this little boy would play with the bees, knowing that they were harmless, that they had lost their sting. Brothers and sisters, I know some of us are scared of bees, and almost everybody is scared of death. But Jesus has taken the stinger out of death. He has removed the fearful power that once could haunt us as we thought about being absent from the body and being present with the Lord, our Maker. How terrifying to be in the hands of an angry God who is described in Scripture as a consuming fire. But our sins have been forgiven and washed away by Jesus' death. There is nothing to fear in death anymore for the Christian. The truly terrifying part, like that stinger, is gone. And because of that, we can have courage to live for Jesus. As Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6 says, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear for what can man do to me. So this is the first motivation for courageous living. Christ removed death and its sting. But notice there's a second motivator in our verse, in verse 10. And it's this, that Christ brought you and me and every other Christian life and immortality. Christ removed death, and in its place he has given us life. 
and immortality. Jesus said that he is the resurrection and the life. And through belief in him, we will also live forever, even if we die for a short while. And this promise of eternal life is given to us through the assurance we receive in Christ's resurrection. Just before Jesus faced Calvary, he promised his disciples in John 14, 19, he said this, Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you also will live. 1 John 5, 11 and 12 says this, And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. This newness of life is regeneration through Christ Jesus. We were once dead. We were slaves to sin. But through Christ's death and his resurrection... We have been given eternal life. We are now, according to Romans 6, 2, dead to sin. And because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we shall be raised physically as he was raised physically, it says in Romans 6, 5. This is the second half of what Christ achieved for us. It is immortality. The word for immortality that we are incapable of Perishing, it means that we are incapable of being subject to decay. These bodies are described in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 5, as being tents. Tents wear out over time. My family, who loves to go camping, have replaced our tent about four or five times. We replace them from wear and tear because they have become unusable. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5. He describes this longing that we have for a new life, that our bodies actually groan for it. In verse 4 it says, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. What a great picture. The mortal swallowed up by the immortal. Immortal. What was worn out is swallowed up by what can never be worn out. That's why we should spend little time worrying about problems that may seem very serious to us here on this earth, but are really temporary problems. We face them. Sometimes we face them in temporary situations, and sometimes they are unprecedented, like the days that we live in now. But they are, make no mistake about it, only temporary. And we are to be more concerned with heavenly realities that the Bible talks about. Think about, for instance, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, where it says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, that's resurrection language, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. If you turn there, look again at verse 4. Who is your life? Our life is hidden in Christ, not in our problems and fears. Don't forget that. This truth, the last part of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10 says, was brought to light through the gospel. This has always been God's plan. It is the gospel that brings these wonderful truths to reality. 
And this is central to why Paul wants Timothy to be courageous and to continue on in the midst of something that seems fearful, to tell others about Jesus. Because without a preacher, the world will be ignorant of these grand truths. They will never see God's design and the glory of it through the cross of Jesus Christ. I mean, think about it. Who would ever in their right mind trade a tired and torn and beat up and dusty and old and faded tents for a glorious and beautiful mansion? I don't think anyone would. But we can sometimes cling so dearly to this world because we think we need it. Because we think this is the best that there is. But it's not. Paul told Timothy, and he tells us as well through the word of God and his spirit, to live your life to the fullest for Christ. Not trying to save your life, but living it with eternity in view. I mean, what do you have to lose? Just an old tent that will be replaced by a glorious reality that far exceeds anything that you or I can hope or dream. This body, this perishable body, will be resurrected one day and be given an imperishable, glorified body. What confidence, what courage we can have when we remember that our temporary life on this earth, this vapor of a life, will one day be replaced by a superior immortality that is eternal and better in every way. Boy, that's some motivation for courageous living, isn't it? We have a third motivation given to us in verse 11. The third motivation is that Christ commissioned you. Yes, Christ commissioned you, Christian. It says in verse 11, For which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher. You know, as Paul lived his life, he couldn't disconnect the life that he lived from the call of Christ upon him. He didn't have a compartment over here for the Christian life, for the church life, and then over here for the everyday life, for school and for work and for family and home and separated from itself. Because he was the one that said in Philippians 1.21, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So how then could he separate the life that he had, the life that he'd been given from the calling that God had commissioned him to fulfill? How could he make those two different things? He couldn't. It was all one life. And here in this verse, verse 11, Paul mentions three areas in which he'd been appointed by the Lord. He first mentions preacher, then apostle, and then teacher. Now, he's writing this to Timothy, and of those three, Timothy was a preacher and a teacher. So let me just briefly define these three commissions that Paul mentions here in this verse. Preacher comes from the Greek word kerux. Keruso is to proclaim, and it refers to a herald, a proclaimer. It's not necessarily the guy in the church behind the pulpit, but it's an official of the king, one who announced to the world the message that he was given by his king. All of us, in some way or another, as Christians, are called as heralds of the gospel. The second commission is apostle. And this word here, in this context, refers to a special calling that Paul received from God as his chosen instrument to speak with Christ's authority. Now, Timothy wasn't an apostle, and neither are you and I. But we do have the authority to speak the word of God as we have it in the scriptures. And then finally, there's the teacher. A, a teacher is a person who explains the meaning of the Bible. Now, apostle and prophet and teacher, all of these, excuse me, apostle, preacher, and teacher, all of these are 
um, are gifts given by God to the church, a special endowment that is given to those Christians that have these things. But in some ways, we are all called to declare the truth, and the teacher does that. Some do it better than others because God has gifted them in this way. But many Christians need to do it in some sort of setting. You might have to do it in a discipleship setting. You might have to do it as a Sunday school teacher. But all of us as Christians will need to teach the word of God in some form or another. And the message of the gospel is the means by which we tell the world about the death and the resurrection of Christ. That death which abolished death itself and brought about life and immortality to light. And you know, we can't leave the duty of this message for someone else to tell when we have all been called in some form or another to speak of it ourselves. And we shouldn't think of this as a burden because it's not. It's an incredible privilege. Right now in our world, there is so much despair and anxiety and fear and selfishness. They need to hear this message. And since for many of us, the church is closed, we are the messengers that our neighbors need to hear from. I don't know how many of you have had this problem with your kids, but when our kids were small, and even sometimes now, they practically burst if they knew a secret that nobody else knew. Sometimes I would get home from work and before my wife could even say welcome home, one of the kids would be telling me the good news that my wife had been waiting all day to share with me. You know, my friends, we have so much better news in the gospel, don't we? We have been appointed as heralds of the message of the king, the authoritative message of God. And we need to go and proclaim it to the world. Because our world has always, as much as now, needed so desperately to hear this good news. The weekly news, the nightly news, the newspapers, social media, we are being bombarded minute by minute with bad news of fear and death. The world needs the good news of Jesus Christ. And we can't forget our commission to go out and take it. This is a motivation. Why has God put us where he's put us today? The motivation is so that we would go out and courageously proclaim this gospel message. It is our commission. There's one more that I want to share with you. It's in verse 12, at the beginning of verse 12. And it's this, that Christ ordained your suffering. Notice what it says in verse 12. Which is why I suffer as I do. That's really connected to the reality of our commission. I mean, you and I might be bursting to tell others about Christ. Uh, many new Christians are like that. They want to tell their friends and their family about what God has done for them. But very soon we can come to realize that the world doesn't share our enthusiasm. What brings us joy will many times in them stir up anger and even at best disdain. The apostle doesn't want to give the impression that the world will welcome the beautiful gospel with open arms. That does happen at times. But he acknowledges the fact when he writes that this message was why he was in prison. It's why I suffer as I do, he says. Paul won't tell Timothy that he goes out and he preaches this gospel message that people will begin to love him. They'll embrace him. They'll accept him. They'll welcome him in. They'll tell him to tell their friends because the reality is most won't. They wouldn't do it for Paul. They wouldn't do it for Timothy. They wouldn't do it for our Lord. And they won't do it for us. As a matter of fact, Paul is warning Timothy and saying, some are going to seek to harm you. Some might even kill you. And many times they'll react the same way toward us. 
They won't want to listen. They may be hostile. Now, there is amazingly good news in the gospel, but the world won't see it since their own sin has blinded them to their own selfishness. The Bible tells us that they love their sin and they will hate anyone or anything that comes between them and their sin. And as a faithful gospel herald, we will come between them and their sin, those things that they cast their hopes and their dreams on. But they need to hear the truth. Going back to the grace and purpose of God's plan before the ages, referred to back in verse 9, we can find comfort in the fact that the suffering that Paul faced, and later that Timothy would face, and that we might even face, It's not an accident, but it's a part of God's plan. Charles Spurgeon said it best. I love this saying. Spurgeon said, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. What Spurgeon meant by this was that suffering, like anything else, that comes against us and brings suffering and pain. It drives us to Christ and it drives us to intimacy with him. Paul suffered because he loved Christ enough to preach about him, but his preaching produced pain and suffering and trials and persecution. But then this persecution pushed Paul to love and need Christ even more. If we're surprised by our suffering, then we have forgotten or maybe never realized that this suffering, that trials in our lives are a necessary part of the Christian life. Paul later writes in this very letter of 2 Timothy, in chapter 3, verse 12, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You might think, okay, I can see how a warning about persecution would be helpful, but how in the world is this a motivation or an encouragement for us? Well, back in Acts chapter 14, when Paul and Barnabas were still a missionary team, as they headed back to Jerusalem, Luke wrote in Acts 14.22 that they wanted to strengthen and encourage the church to continue in the faith. And they did this by saying, listen to what he says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. That's how they encouraged them, by telling them the truth. This means that we're supposed to have persecutions on our way to heaven. We We cannot expect that the path to heaven will be without trials. Trials produce spiritual endurance. James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 tell us. This too is part of God's plan. This endurance is in addition to the growing love and faith that we gain when we turn in dependence to Christ. We see in trials that we truly are following Christ, who also suffered hardship and persecution. To follow Jesus doesn't mean just to obey him. To follow Jesus means to be like him, to look like him, to suffer through the similar things that he suffered through in many ways because we love him. When I read the story the other day about a man that was convicted of wearing military medals that he didn't earn, So he was on trial for violating the Stolen Valor Act of 2006. The man's name was Joe Swisher. He enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps, and he was honorably discharged in 1957. But he was awarded no medals. However, he wore on his uniform several medals, including the Silver Star, the Navy and Marine Corps ribbon, the Purple Heart, 
and the Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medal with a bronze V. He claimed to have killed many men during the Korean War, even though the military records showed that he enlisted after the Korean War had ended. You know, trials and persecutions are a lot as Christians because we are at war. It is a spiritual war. And if somebody comes out of this world with no scars and no wounds and no pains and no war stories, then we might be able to assume that they never were at war. And maybe that they were never even really enlisted in the Lord's army. But when we face the battle and we endure for Christ, as we grow in faith and love and hope, we will also grow in maturity, in love for Christ and for one another. Paul wanted Timothy to understand that his imprisonment for Christ was not a reason for shame, but rather that it was a medal of honor given to him by the great commander-in-chief, and that he needed to be ready in case he was called up to give himself for the cause of Christ as well. This is something that we all need to be prepared for as well. Well, in our time in the Word, we've seen four motivations that hopefully have encouraged you. Hopefully they've even emboldened you and prepared you for battle. They have been, number one, that Christ abolished death for you as a Christian. Secondly, that Christ brought you life and immortality. Thirdly, that Christ commissioned you. And fourthly, that Christ ordained your suffering. Now we need to ask ourselves, are we prepared? Am I prepared? to be courageous for Christ in these times that we live. We have nothing to lose because Christ has secured our every blessing under heaven. But we also have a sobering duty that we need to carry out. We are the means by which the gospel message will be carried to the world. You may not be able to go very many places right now, but you have a phone and you have a computer, and you have other ways and means by which you can contact others and share with them, those that are hopeless, the hope of Christ. Because we can't fail in our duty. None of us can. We have to all do what Christ has commanded us to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these motivations that you have given us for these difficult days. Help us to place our hope in Christ Jesus, that this old tired body that becomes riddled with scars and with aches and pains and sickness will one day die, no matter how much we put the effort into keeping it alive, keeping it fresh looking, keeping it healthy, keeping it exercised. This mortal body one day will pass into death, but you, for those that are your children, will raise it up immortal. We will join you in heaven, and we will be glorified. For those who reject you, you also will resurrect them. It will be unto death, so that their immortal bodies can withstand an eternity at separation in hell apart from you. Oh God, I pray that you would help us to not have our eyes fixed on our own health, our own safety, so much as our eyes would be fixed on you, fixed on the job that you've given to us to do. Help my brothers and sisters, Lord God. Help them to be encouraged in what you have done, what you have accomplished through Jesus on the cross. And I pray, Lord, that we would remember that if we die in this sickness, we go to heaven with Christ. But if our unbelieving neighbors and family and friend die in this sickness, then their fate is worse than anything they've experienced on this earth in that sickness. May we see this as a perfect time for us to share the love of Christ with our friends and our family and our neighbors.
And I pray, Lord God, that you would secure us to the anchor of Christ, that there is nothing on this earth that will ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And I ask you, Father, that in that comfort, in that security, in that peace, we might carry out the work that you've given us to do. Thank you for the reality that our job right now is not to stay at home and just worry. You have given us so much to do in this time. May we redeem the time for the days are evil. It's in Christ Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. The Lord bless you and be with you.